Hello and welcome from Buenos Aires, Argentina, to this episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where Nathan's conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those that have some connection to Latin America. My name is Josefina Dominguez, and I am an editor for Latin List, a proud sponsor of the Crossing Borders podcast. Sign up for our weekly updates on latinlist.com to get a summary of the week's biggest headlines in Latin American tech news. Nate's guest today is David Poritz, the co-CEO and co-founder of Credit Justo, an online credit lending platform for SMEs in Latin America. They talk about the opportunity David and his co-founder identified in Mexico to bring institutional capital to a segment that traditionally lacked access to credit, as well as how Credit Justo has grown since founding in 2015. They also talk about David's lessons learned from working in human rights and nonprofits and why working with impact investors is so important to him. We hope you enjoy this conversation with David Poritz. Hey, David, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being willing to do it. Good morning, Nathan. Great to be here. Where are you in the world today? I am currently in Mexico City. And where are you from originally? I originally grew up actually in the Northeast. So uh, I was born in Massachusetts and I spent most of my, uh, you know, elementary, middle, high school years, but kind of between Massachusetts and New York. Uh, so I'm, you know, very much a New Englander. We've got better weather now this time of year. <laughs> you can, uh, uh, you know, absolutely. That's definitely the case. So tell me a little bit about Credit Justo. What do you guys do? So Credit Justo was founded in 2015. Uh, so we're, you know, you, you know, you know, we've been at this for a little over five years, uh, and we were really the first uh, technology-enabled lending platform for the Mexican market. Uh, when we started the business, I'm sure much, I'm sure you and many of your, you know, uh, you know, of the listeners remember, you know, technology enabled lending or fintech generally was very much blossoming and expanding in the United States and Europe. Uh, and we felt that there was a unique opportunity to really bring institutional capital and combine that with robust technology to serve, you know, the over 6 million small to medium sized enterprises and businesses in the Mexican market that historically have lacked access to credit. Uh, so we've really built um, really the first and the largest technology enabled solution for uh, this market segment in Mexico. Uh, and um, our vision very early on was to develop a multi product platform that was not, you know, an individual sole credit product, but rather was a variety of credit products that could really meet all of the financing needs of our borrowers. And I think that we've really you know, come full circle and, you know, have executed on that vision. Uh, so that's just a little bit of background on who we are. So talk a little bit about some of the, you've, you've said you've executed on it and you, you have done well between having clients, raising money. Talk a little bit about where you are today. So today we're uh, around 250 employees. Uh, we've raised uh, approximately $80 million in equity uh, and an additional $250 million in debt. Uh, I think one of the things that was important for us was to be able to create from the very beginning a really robust uh, institutional equity and debt base to support the business, given that these types of businesses do require significant capital to scale. You know, our, you know, our first investor was John Mack, the ex-CEO of Morgan Stanley and Credit Suisse. Um, we were Victory Park Capital's first investment in Mexico, uh, uh, Broadhaven Capital Partners, um, Elevar Equity, uh, and then later on, uh, our Series A was led by Kazakh Ventures and QED. Our Series B was led by Goldman Sachs, the Principal Strategic Investments Group, uh, and Point72. And in many of those groups, we were their first exposure or their first investment uh, into the Mexican market. Uh, so I think for us, it's really about building early relationships with these partners and being able to scale with them and being able to support our growth as we become larger. So you're in a group of uh, some entrepreneurs that I've had on the podcast and also similar to me that are uh, from the U.S. originally or from Europe originally. 
and have social sciences backgrounds and have gotten into tech and in this case finance. How, how did that happen? How did a guy from the Northeast end up in, in Latin America and going from social sciences to fintech? Yeah, so I studied, you know, you know I studied anthropology uh, and Latin American and Caribbean studies at Brown. And my prior interest, you know, up until, you know, 2013 or so was really, uh, you know, human rights uh, in Latin America. I, my, you know, my previous professional career, I, I ran a nonprofit uh, that developed the first environmental, social and safety standards for the energy industry, for the renewables and the oil and gas sector. And most of our work was focused actually on Latin America. So I did, I spent a lot of time in Peru and Ecuador, Colombia and in Mexico. Uh, and then I went off uh, uh, kind of right as I finished my undergrad uh, and I spent a couple of years in the UK uh, getting a master's. And it was right around that time when, uh, as I alluded to earlier, tech enabled lending and FinTech was really blossoming. And you had, you know, it was kind of the first wave you know, uh, you know, Lending Club and, you know, Prosper and SoFi and Funding Circle and a lot of the kind of usual suspects. Uh, and I was fascinated because I was interested in financial inclusion broadly as a theme. Uh, and I felt that the strategies that were being developed that were technology enabled and technology supported in the US and in Europe were really applicable to the Mexican market. Uh, or I should say to the Latin American market more broadly in emerging, you know, emerging economies. And one of my very close friends and the co-founder of Credit Justo, Alan, uh, Alan Apog, who grew up in Mexico City uh, and, was, and it was at that point in time working in finance, you know, he also saw a similar trend and a similar set of themes. So I think it was a confluence of, you know, one, financial inclusion and being interested in it broadly combined with what was happening in the U.S. and Europe uh, and our ongoing interests in Latin America. What were some of the lessons you learned or took from your background working in human rights and nonprofits to start a business? I think the first really key point that's been a guiding principle for us is that you need to create a business that's really customer centric and you need to build, you really need to build products and services that truly meet the needs of, in this case, our borrowers and our clients and figure out ways that you can grow with them. So for example, you know, as uh, you know, if we give an initial loan to a client, you know, the hope, and in most cases, the outcome of that loan is that the business will be able to grow, that it will be able to become more successful, more profitable, such that when they come back, you're able to offer them, you know, subsequent financing products that are more attractive whether that be being able to offer them more capital or at a more, or, you know, or with more attractive pricing. So I think for us, it's really been about how do you build a customer focused, customer centric business, which has not been the case in Latin America and particularly Mexico in the financial services industry. You know, if you look at, you know, uh, you know, uh, MPS scores or things like that, you know, they're, you know, you know, they're shockingly low partially because banks and other financial services companies just, have really looked at themselves historically as, you know, we have a commodity, which is, you know, cash or finance or money, which, you know, our clients don't. So therefore we can kind of operate how we wish. And I think that that's changing dramatically and groups are evolving. And for us, I think that learning very early on that you need to develop a business around the customer that truly creates value for them over time has been a critical guide in everything that we do. So set the stage back in 2015 when you're, you're getting started. What was it like for someone who's now a client of yours trying to get financial services in Mexico? Well, so if you were a small to medium sized business, uh, you know, uh, one at that point in time, banks were had very, very, very little interest. So it was virtually impossible for a small semi formal informal business to get financing. So banks would reject them. Uh, they, you know, some clients perhaps would have a credit card, uh, and that would be a personal credit card that they might use to support some of their financing needs for their business. Or very commonly, they would just have to end up going to friends and family to try to get informal loans to support, you know, uh, the growth of their business. 
Uh, and this, you know, was the case both, you know, for micro businesses, but also for medium sized businesses and even middle market businesses who just did not have strong financial relationships with banks to support them, you know, in their ability to grow. So, you know, a, you know, a classic case study would be, let's say you had a family run business, which could be, you know, which was a restaurant that was fairly large that maybe had four to six locations had been working and banking with a traditional bank, such as a, you know, um, you know, a Santander or a Scotia bank or any of these other, you know, large banks in Mexico, Citibank, they would go in, uh, you know, and say, look, I want to, you know, uh, you, I've been banking with you for 15 years. I want to open up a new rec. I want to expand my chain from six to, you know, to seven or eight. And I need, you know, a $200,000. And they would walk out with, you know, instead of $200,000, they might walk out with 15 to $20,000. And the problem is that didn't really address the fundamental liquidity or, you know, capital needs of the business. And I think that's where we said, wow, there's clearly an opportunity to fill the need and to really work with these businesses and to support their growth. So when you decided to start the business, what were the first couple of steps you took to start to build it? Because all the way back then, maybe you had a little bit of investment, but it's a far cry from the couple hundred employees and, uh, tens of millions of, of equity raised and, and hundreds of millions of debt. What was it like getting started? Well, you know, we, you know, we started in our house. So, you know, Alan and I, uh, and some of the early employees, you know, you know, we, you know, we rented a house. We all live there. It's kind of your classic startup story. Uh, you know, we were initially, all of us were involved in kind of deciding every, you know, every early disbursement. Uh, and then we really started, you know, bringing on and building the tech team and, you know, really working to automate. Uh, but it was, you know, it was very artisanal early on. And it was, you know, I think 2015, 2016 were, you know, years where we were really figuring out what the client wanted, how we could, you know, create the best possible value proposition. It wasn't really till 2017 that we really, there was more of a click moment and we figured out kind of product market, how to get it right. Uh, and I think it was really 2017, 2018, 2019, when we really kind of started to reach kind of like the hockey stick like growth that, you know, that you often want in a startup. So it was, it was definitely an interesting, you know, um, a really interesting entrepreneurial journey because early on it was not easy. You know, we were working with very limited capital and it wasn't till, you know, we really had the flexibility to bring on the additional capital you know, to uh, really to be able to scale and to be able to grow. So yeah, it was, you know, classic kind of startup, you know, literally, you know, starting out of your kitchen and, you know, your dining room and then really growing from there. Do you remember any inflection points from that period from 2015 to say 2017 when you were just starting to either get product market fit or when you started to say, hey, this could really be a big business? Yeah, I think it was, you know, we, so neither Alan nor I were technical founders. And I think one of them, I think this is an important learning, you know, we were, you know, kind of generalist, you know, we both went to, you know, liberal, you know, uh, you know, I met Alan at Brown and we both went to, you know, obviously had a liberal arts background. Uh, Alan had more finance experience than I did. Uh, so I think we were kind of, trying to wear a variety of different hats. You know, we were learning credit risk and underwriting. We were working to build our technology team where we were working to build our commercial team. And I think it's once we started to bring on a few specialized folks in those areas that really had experience, particularly in the commercial growth side and the tech side that we just like saw this very like immediate, uh, you know, inflection. And I think it's an important learning that, I think one of the early errors that we made is we should have brought on co-founders, both in the, who had, who had deep commercial growth experience uh, and on the technology side. And eventually we were able to bring on those people with the experience. It just took longer than it might have had we brought them on very, very early. So I think for us, there was a, like a very, very tangible, noticeable inflection point when those first professionals came on and we had thought partners that really had the experience to help us begin to develop the strategies to grow in those areas. So I would, you know, for any, I don't know, any entrepreneurs or folks listening, 
I think, you know, bring, think about what really you do well and think about what, you know, as initial founders, what skill sets you lack. And, you know, it's worth the investment, you know, and the, perhaps the dilution to bring on those people early, because in our case, since we've done that, the, you know, it's been, you know, just the growth and the numbers speak for themselves. You're one of the more later stage companies in, in Mexico now, um, having been able to raise money and grow. And a lot of companies that maybe are a little bit behind you in terms of maybe they were founded later, um, or they just are still starting to maybe just go up that uh, faster growth ramp. And when they're thinking about growing the team, a lot of times teams will break, you know, from founders to 10 to 15 employees. And then again, when you get to 50 to 75, and then again, when you get to 150 or so, have you, have you experienced that? And how, what advice would you give to founders that are maybe have grown, but haven't changed some processes to put in better management um, or are just going through that process? Yeah, I think it's a fantastic question and it's totally real in our case. I, I think we've been through three turns of people of, you know, of team. So it's, it, and it's, you know, uh, when people ask me, I'm like, and, and when I start thinking about it, I'm like, they were very, so like year, probably 18 months in, you know, I would say so about, yeah, about a year and a half in, there was a very tangible, uh, you know, uh, improvement and maturity of the team, which I just alluded to in terms of bringing on really strong professional tech talent, bringing on really strong, uh, expertise and growth. Um, and then about 18 months, you know, later, so, you know, about kind of where we're at the three year mark, definitely kind of a similar situation. And yeah, it's, you know, I think it's the, it's the organic part of the kind of entrepreneurial journey. And it's, it's, it's a real, you know, it's real. And, you know, we just went through, I think kind of our third turn at the end of last year. So like the end of 2019, you know, we completed our series B uh, in, you know, in August of last year. And I think, you know, towards the end of 2019, early 2020, we really started to bring in even more experienced professionals. And at each stage, I think you realize and you can begin to appreciate the impact that, you know, experience uh, and track record being, you know, you know, brings to a business. And obviously, you know, as a very early stage company, we couldn't afford the seniority that we have now, but as you grow, and I think, and as you are able to do that, you start to realize the, like the, the, the tangible impact that even one person can have on the business. So, yeah, I just, you know, for us, it was, you know, uh, each kind of like every year and a half, two years as the business reached, subsequently a more mature phase, we really, really focused on people and we really focused on how we could attract the best talent in our market or in certain cases needing to bring people from outside of Mexico. And I think that's what has really been the key to our success. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's something that we will definitely continue to do in terms of investing in the best people possible. There's a lot of talk in Latin America about uh, impact investing and with your background in human rights and also having an impact investor like an Elevar on your cap table. How did you think about that and why is it important? So for us, I think we have a really interesting mix of partners. So, you know, we have you know, very traditional banks like Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse uh, and some local credit funds in Mexico, as well as some European credit funds. But then we also work with a lot of impact investors. So Elevar was our first impact investor that we have a very strong relationship with. Uh, we work, you know, another equity partner, Ignia, which is in the impact field. Uh, and then on the debt side, we work with uh, PG Impact or Partners Group Impact, which is a well-regarded impact fund on the debt side. Uh, we work with Calvert, which is another uh, well-known DC-based impact fund. Uh, we work with DFC, which was formerly called OPIC, which is, uh, you know, part of a multilateral group, which we have a strong relationship with as well. So for us, impact investors have been critical sources of capital early on and throughout our, you know, our trajectory. And I think it's about building a business that resonates with very traditional investors and venture groups, but also developing a business that inherently is having tangible impact. So in our case, it sounds 
seemingly simple, but our, our economic success and our growth is directly linked to the level of impact that we have in terms of improving, uh, you know, access and, uh, you know, supporting uh, businesses, uh, you know, in their growth trajectory. So if we, the more we grow, the more we grow our, our, you know, our, you know, our base of clients, the more we are delivering on our impact story in terms of supporting financial inclusion in the Mexican market. So I think, you know, my prior work, uh, you know, in the human rights space, I think, you know, and particularly I was very interested in kind of the, these hybrid social enterprise models. I realized that it was, it's very hard to find and build a true social enterprise that both can develop and generate economic activity, but also really be a force of, you know, good. And I think financial inclusion and in our case, fintech actually is one of the most natural fits for those two things, particularly if you develop a set of products that really meet the borrower's needs and is really a consumer centric approach. What are the one or two biggest things that you wished people who didn't know your business well understood about your business? This can either be from back in 2015, 16, when you were just starting or today? I think what we've done, you know, so I guess, let me step back. I think SME lending broadly is become, I think a fairly uh, like a hot attractive space where there's a lot of capital and a lot of interest in it. And I think, you know, obviously COVID has impacted small businesses in a very dramatic way, particularly in the United States. Uh, but I still think, you know, the SME space is going to be a segment that has longevity and importance to it. Uh, and when people think about SME finance, I think, you know, they often think about, oh, you know, unsecured, you know, uh, all digital, all online, you know, micro tickets, that sort of thing. And I think we've taken an approach that's very different, uh, but I think has been key to our success which is we initially started out with all, with, all, with all secured lending products. So all of our products that are actually asset backed. And we wanted to, part of our early view was there was so much unencumbered collateral in our market. We wanted to take advantage and unlock real estate that clients may have and be able to lend against that. And I think it's been a really critical aspect to our success. Our credit performance has been absolutely stellar over the course of COVID, which unfortunately has not been the case for many unsecured lenders. So for us, we're able to come out of COVID and say, you know, we were able to leverage uh, secured lending products and scale a secured lending model. And now that gives us the basis to have the credibility to then move beyond secured into other products. So we just launched about six weeks ago, um, a really exciting uh, partnership with Uber Eats. So Uber Eats has about 25 to 30,000 restaurants in Mexico. We became their exclusive financing partner and that's an unsecured lending model where we link up directly with Uber. We get access uh, to, you know, to data and we're able to do a fully digital, fully unsecured model. So I think one of the things is I think it's when, when folks are looking at you know, SME lending, I think it's important to understand kind of where the different players are. And I think we've taken a unconventional approach, but it's an approach that's really paid off for us, at least in the context of COVID. If you could go back to when you were first starting the business, knowing everything you know today, what advice would you give yourself? The first thing which I already mentioned is invest in creating a founder, a founding team that clearly is specialized and is, has skills that you do not have. So in specifically in our case, that would have been the commercial growth side and the technology side. So I think literally we could have saved ourselves 18 to 24 months had we brought on at inception other co-founders that had that skill set. So I think I just wanted to reiterate that because I think that's really, really critical. Uh, and I think the other piece is as early as possible, particularly if you're operating in emerging markets. I know it's much easier said than done, but as soon as you can bring on, you know, and move away from kind of friends and family and, and you really lock down your first kind of institutional partner, it creates so much, uh, it creates a, like a, so much positive uh, optics and kind of a virtuous cycle where it becomes that much easier to attract subsequent capital. So I think investing in, 
getting a really robust early financial partner and coupling that with, you know, filling your own personal gaps uh, uh, on the skill side is so critical to, you know, you know, you know, to success. And I think in our case, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, has been fundamental. What's next for the business over the next year or two? I think the critical piece for us is we're expanding both our multi-product strategy. Uh, so we're launching new products, which is an important part of our you know, vision. We're also launching non-lending products, which is important. So I think pure play lenders is a concept of the past. You need to be, you know, as a business to really create underlying value for your clients and underlying enterprise value. You need to be both a company that is capable of launching lending products for small businesses, but also non-lending fee-based products or, or just value-added products, whether that be financial planning tools or other assets. So I think we are you know, very much of that view that to become the primary financing solution for our clients and our borrowers, you need to go beyond one product to two products. You really need to you know, launch a number of things. So we're, uh, we've partnered with American Express um, and we're going to be launching, we're one of their first fintech partnerships in the, me in the Mexican market. That's going to be uh, on the back of Uber. Uh, American Express is a, uh, is a really exciting partnership that we're launching, uh, you know, end of this year, early next year uh, in terms of uh, an SME card product. Uh, so yeah, I think we have a lot of, a lot of things in the mix and uh, I think we're, yeah, it's, it's exciting because I, you know, I'm as optimistic as I've ever been about, you know, this market. I think, unfortunately, similar to 2008 and 2009 in situations where there's financial volatility, uh, you know, generally banks retrench uh, and the SME segment in emerging markets. And in, as in the case in Latin America is usually one of the first places where they kind of shut off the tap, if you will. So I just think that there's tremendous market need and there's going to be ongoing tremendous market need going into 2021 from small businesses. And we're really well positioned to meet that need and to really grow and gain market share over the next, you know, six, 18 months. Thanks for sharing your story, David. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I hope that you guys are able to execute even more going forward. It's a huge market that needs a solution. So Thanks for uh, working at it. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share our story. And uh, as is the case of any listeners of any questions, uh, would love to hear from them. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Crossing Borders with our guest, David Ports. And thank you to Angel Andraca for producing this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with a friend and give us a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. It's the best way to share what's going on in Latin America's ecosystem. 